particularly for those that may not see this frequently and may not be an orthopedic surgeon or, um, you know, or, or really, a, really a kind of a musculoskeletal provider. So um, some of it is not intended to be basic, but really we just want to capture all the important parts of, of the hip exam. Really encourage you guys to ask questions. So if you can email, text, um, get it to us, we'd, we'd love to answer it. If we don't get a chance to answer it to it live here, uh, certainly have an opportunity to uh, try to answer it uh, electronically um, later. Um, like Jared said, we're really excited to get uh, Coffee Kids Sports Medicine back um, into a live version. Uh, we really hope to continue this on a quarterly basis, so please continue to look out uh, for not only on-demand, but uh, live sessions as well. Uh, as Jared said, I had no relevant disclosures. Um, I like to give talks like this and, and present some cases. So I'm, I'm going to give you guys a couple patients. We're going to talk about them and, and kind of how we evaluate them and we get to the diagnosis. Caroline here, she's a 16-year-old female. Uh, I've really taken care of her for a long, long time. Um, she's a cross-country runner. She kind of does that uh, mainly with uh, her physical uh, physical education at school. Um, she's kind of had this like hip and thigh pain for about two months, gradual onset, really some painless popping as well. Uh, that she reports. We got a couple other kids here. You can see a wide range. We got Anna. Uh, she's a 14 year old female. She had sudden severe pain to the hip. You got Tyler, plays basketball. He really, well, he doesn't have pain, but his parents say he's limping uh, when he's playing basketball and they're worried about it. And you have Alfonso, who has kind of worsening groin pain uh, over a period of time. No major injury really will note it. So we're going to try to cover each one of these and kind of how we uh, go through their evaluation. You know, hip conditions um, in an athlete, and, and what, what is really unique um, about what we do here is, is we like to use the word young athlete. And this is really different because an adult sports medicine surgeon may have a very different differential diagnosis than perhaps one that's used to taking care of youth athletes. Things like osteonecrosis, idiopathic osteonecrosis uh, can occur in the youth athlete. We've all heard of skiffy. In fact, we're all, we've all heard of nervous of a skiffy. Hip dysplasia oftentimes can come at a young adolescent or even a young adult. Apophysitis, we'll talk a little bit more about that, apophyseal avulsion. Um, certain kinds of dysplasia, like epiphyseal dysplasia, we can really see in a youth um, athlete. You may not see that in an adult as well. Infections, a little bit higher prevalence in the, uh, in the young patient than in the older. Uh, stress fractures as well. So today what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the anatomy, pathology, um, associated with adolescent hip pain in the youth athlete. We're going to really try to do a um, clinical evaluation of the youth athlete um, and, and really discuss where to send them, how to evaluate them, and, and when to make a referral if needed. Um, and then what, what are some really common diagnoses and what are some clinical features uh, to some common diagnoses as well. So first, the anatomy. All right. So this is an AP pelvis. It's an x-ray um, of the pelvis. Uh, probably one of the best x-rays to look at um, because you can see so much. You can see the right side, you can see the left side, you get a little bit of a view of the lumbar spine, you can see that in red. In pink, you can see the sacrum, um, and then you get the pelvis. Um, and so this is really a common one-shot image of the pelvis and the hip joint that gives you quite a bit of information, particularly in a youth athlete. You know, what we try to do is hone in on the hip joint. So the AP pelvis is really valuable, but we oftentimes take a really hard look at the hip joint itself, and we can oftentimes blow these up. The, the hip joint is really a ball and socket joint. It's not really a hinge joint, it's a ball and socket joint, which means it has um, all six really degrees of freedom. So it moves around quite a bit. You can see the ball, we call that the femoral head or the head of the femur. The socket is called the acetabulum, um, and this is where the ball lies and you can see that in blue. Now, the, what's interesting in a youth athlete is that we have growth plates, or we call that the physis. Many of you guys already know that. The acetabular physis is really where all three bones of the pelvis come together. Oftentimes, we call that the triradiate cartilage. The proximal femoral physis, this really appears at a very, very young age and doesn't really go away until 16, 17, 18 years old. So much older does this actually completely go away. And then you have the greater troche apophysis um, that really also, uh, you can visually see it at a very young age and doesn't really go away until 15-year-old females or 17-year-olds and males. So 
This is what makes a youth athlete very different from an adult athlete. So, you know, what is an apophysis? We use that term a lot, um, and, I, and I would say the most common one is a tibial tubercle, particularly to pediatricians and those used to taking care of youth athletes because of Oshkut slaughter. That's an apophysis. Apophysis is really a secondary growth plate where a tendon inserts onto. So the patella tendon inserts into the tibial tubercle, and that's where we get apophysitis. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but the pelvis really has lots of apophyses around it. These are all where muscles attached to tendons, attached to the pelvis, and you can see, the, see many of them there in yellow. Now, this is really important because a very common cause of hip pain in the youth athlete. You can see that's where the hamstrings um, insert into the uh, ischial tuberosity. You've got your hip flexors, um, you've got your hip abductors, and you've got your abdominal muscles, all attaching to secondary growth centers around the pelvis, all, all causes of pain. Uh, to be to, to kind of put into your mind when you're evaluating a uh, youth athlete with hip pain. So how do we evaluate how do we evaluate a youth athlete? Now before we get started, I got five hard rules. Now some of these are applicable to other areas um, of the body, but we're just going to go over these five hard rules. Um, you, you, the history is really important and oftentimes can lead you to a focused exam. So always put that in perspective. And try not to make your exam routine, although sometimes we teach it very routine. Always examine both sides. This is really paramount, particularly in a youth athlete. You need to be sure that you can adequately expose the area of interest. Now, that's sometimes very hard to do. Um, I'm going to show you a video of a three-minute physical exam of the hip. Um, it's my daughter. Uh, she's wearing tights. It's not ideal, but for the purposes of the video, you guys just need to know that we use tights for it, but sometimes you know, we like to use paper shorts to where you can really still keep the patient exposed, but allow you to visualize the area of interest. You wanna make sure that there's no areas of swelling, hernias, rashes. You have to be able to, to visualize it to see it very, very well. When you're examining the hip, look beyond the hip. Think about other things that may be causing the hip pain. Could be spine, could be intra-abdominal. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. I do think that the hip is a very sensitive area to a youth athlete, so I would always consider having a chaperone or assistant uh, in the room when you're examining it. All right, so we're just going to go over, and I'm just going to dialogue my three-minute hip exam. This is my daughter, Wynn. Uh, first thing I'm going to have her do is she's just, she's just standing there, and I think it's a great example of looking at her alignment. I think it's really important to look at gait. Gait is really valuable. I want to look for a heel to toe. I want to look for her overall alignment and her strength, does she sway one way to, the, to another? Looking at her from the back is a great opportunity to look at an adolescent's spine. I asked her to bend forward, I look at her flexibility. You can also see if she has a rib hump and do a screening exam for scoliosis. I put my hands on her iliac crest to see if she has any leg length inequality, and then I can look at her strength, asking her to, to balance on one leg versus another. This is another opportunity where I can actually do some forms of tenderness of palpation. I can palpate her greater troch, her iliac crest. I can uh, then climb back to her SI joint, climb up the midline of her back, and then I like to use both fingers and go down uh, her paraspinal muscles. I like to look at all my athletes' squat. I think this is a great representation of hip and core strength. I think it's a great representation of her flexibility. Um, and uh, also, it just kind of gives me an overall understanding of her biomechanics and balance, particularly important in a youth athlete. I like to look at her overall laxity, see if there's any soft tissue swelling. Sometimes the position of the hip can be indicative of the diagnosis. Sometimes it could be flexed um, and externally rotated, indicating uh, some forms of synovitis. I like to do a resisted straight leg raise. This can not only tell me their strength, but if they have any irritations or inflammation of their hip flexors. I flex it up, do an internal external rotation. That's an anterior impingement sign. We'll go over that a little bit more in detail. I like to see if there's any kind of snapping or popping in the hip or can I recreate it. I like to do range of motion with the hip in a flex position, internal and external, and compare it to the contralateral side. This is how I like to do tenderness to palpation. I like a figure four position because it opens up the hip joint. It makes it easier for me to examine all aspects of the hip joint. I'll go over a little bit more of that in detail. Strength with AB and A deduction um, can occur with the knees flexed to about 45 degrees. I like to see if they do a sit up because it looks for um, any evidence of athletic pubalgia. A lateral exam laying on their side is really valuable 
It can tell you a lot about the hip joint. You can look at hip abductor strength. This maneuver looks for IT band tightness. It's called an over test. Um, and also when I flex the hip up, I can do additional tenderness palpation. It kind of opens up the backside of the hip. You can do the SI joint. You can do um, the piriformis, the uh, glute max, as well as the uh, greater trope. Prone is really valuable to look for rotation. It really helps you identify if there's any version um, to uh, femoral version or even tibial torsion. I know a lot of pediatricians, they look a lot at this because parents have a lot of complaints about in towers um, and out towers, and this can really help us understand the overall rotation, particularly in a prone position. Good opportunity to look at hamstring strength as well um, in a prone position. So I know I was talking really fast, but hopefully you guys can use this as a little bit of a three minute, and we're gonna go over all of these aspects a little bit more in detail over the next 20 minutes. So hopefully it'll be helpful for you. Um, and and don't, don't worry about how fast I went because we'll go over a lot of that in much more detail right now. Overall inspection, um, it, it, these are really classic. You know, this is what we learned in, in medical school. Many of you guys learned this in physical therapy or athletic training. Um, everything that you, everything that we learn always starts with inspection, palpation, range of motion, strength, and, and maybe special tests. So we'll go over that a little bit more in detail right now. Inspection, really got to look at the way they walk. It's really important that painless limp sometimes can really lead to the diagnosis, whether it's limping, whether it's an antalgic gait. Standing alignment can really also show you a lot about their strength. You can see this gentleman here, he's standing on his right and his back is really quite neutral. He switches to his left and you see he shifts his body weight all the way over, indicating some hip abductor weakness. And we call this a Trendelenburg sign um, and really can demonstrate some residual weakness in their hip and core. You know, painless limp, kind of like one of our patients already, can really be a sign in an adolescent hip for perthes disease or legs calves perthes disease or osteonecrosis of the hip can also be an early sign of a skiffy or slip caprofemoral epiphysis. So don't hesitate to think about that when you're seeing, um, seeing those for evaluation. When they're walking is another opportunity to look for any signs of popping or snapping. They'll say they feel like my hip snaps out and this is called external uh, snapping hip and it's a very classic complaint that we see in the youth athlete. You can see this is a really dramatic one um, in my patient here. It can be caused both external, which is the IT band, and you can see it, or internal, which is the iliopsoas, and oftentimes you can hear it. Um, another really good thing about the uh, inspection is just to see the way they lie down. You can look for hip flexion contractures. You can see the position of their hip. You can check for hernia swelling, rashes. Sometimes in a kid that has some synovitis, you'll see that they like to, when they lay down, they like to rest their hip with a little bit of external rotation and a little bit of flexion because that relaxes the capsule. What you're seeing here is just looking at some capsular laxity. How do their feet lie when they lay down? And sometimes capsular laxity can be a sign of some micro instability or some early instability of their hip. This is the position I was talking about earlier that if they have some synovitis, whether from infection or inflammation within the hip joint, this is a nice, comfortable resting position. So inspection can be really important. Bony palpation. Now this is really important in the diagnosis of, of hip pain because no matter how much muscle or adipose tissue a young athlete has, you can almost always palpate uh, these bony locations. The greater trope, that's really easy. It's the one that's directly on the side of your hip. Almost anyone can feel it and that oftentimes can be a source of pain or inflammation. Your iliac crest, on the side of your pelvis, as you move around, it goes from front to back. If you follow that all the way forward, you almost feel a localized point on the very front of your pelvis called the ASIS. We already learned earlier that one of your hip flexors um, inserts into this location or originates in this location, and that's your sartorius. You can palpate your sacroiliac joint from behind, and that can be sacroiliitis can be really common in this age group as well. Your pubic symphysis, as well as your ischial tuberosity uh, that you can palpate. This is sometimes really easy to do in the prone position, but you can also do it when they're standing or in a lateral position, and that's where the hamstrings uh, insert. As I mentioned before, apophysitis is inflammation of these growth play centers, or you can have a traumatic injury where you actually have the apophysis pull off the bone. We see really both of these in this population, and this is where the history is really important. If they just have some soreness that has been ongoing for the last three months, and it seems to be tender at the apophysis, then it's apophysitis, inflammation, very similar to tendonitis in an adult. 
If it has an acute injury, I heard a pop, then you know it's an apophyseal avulsion, and that can be a very different consideration for treatment because it's a true fracture that you can see on this gentleman where that ischial tuberosity pulled off of the bone, and that's literally the hamstrings contracting and pulling that growth plate off the bone, and you can see that sliver of bone uh, right there. Soft tissue palpation, we're gonna go back a little bit to our movies here because it makes it just a little bit easier. Again, you heard me mention this earlier, but it's really important uh, to do this in a figure four position. You can see how that just opens up that left hip uh, so much easier uh, for us to, to visualize. So, you know, oftentimes I start at that iliac crest and that ASIS to really understand my soft tissue palpation. If I go just distal to that, you feel a wad of muscle that is your hip flexors. It's a combination of several muscles. Just medial to that is a little bit of a triangle. Sometimes you can see it in a real skinny individual, but that triangle you can really palpate all the way down to that hip joint to see if there's any evidence of inflammation within the hip uh, or a labral tear. And then your adductor, um, your adductor longus attaches to your pelvis and is usually a visible or palpable tendon that's even medial to that, that soft spot I was just referring to that you saw in that video. I think lateral is another really great area to look for tenors to palpation. You can put your hand over the greater trochanter as well. You can see I in this maneuver where I extend the hip, I really stretch out that IT band so I can palpate the IT band all the way from the iliac crest down to the knee. I can then flex the knee. This gives me a better evaluation of the back. I can palpate the SI joint, the piriformis, the glute max. I can even go up and down the spine in this area. And you can see it exposes um, that gluteal crease where you can really palpate the ischial tuberosity as well. And then range of motion. Well, range of motion is really important. You heard me talk about this earlier. I like to do this in a, uh, I like to do this in a supine position. I flex the knee to 90 degrees. This really allows me to look at internal and external rotation. Roughly on average, internal rotation should be about 30 degrees. External rotation should be at about 60 degrees. You really have to compare one side to the other side because sometimes you'll pick up synovitis, osteonecrosis of the hip, just by looking at range of motion, comparing one side to another. Decrease in range of motion is usually more concerning, but increase in range of motion can be an indicative of capsular laxity and can be a source of hip pain in the youth athlete as well. Slip capital femoral epiphysis is a really common thing that we don't, no one here wants to miss. The classic clinical exam feature is when you flex the hip and it, and it undergoes obligate external rotation. That's kind of the buzzword we use is when the hip flexes and it automatically externally rotates that you see in this uh, image here. Now this, this, should be, this should be diagnostic of a slip capital femoral epiphysis until proven otherwise with radiographs. When you see a slip capital femoral epiphysis, as many of us know, that really is an urgent referral, uh, at least a phone call to an orthopedic surgeon or an urgent care or an emergency room because these can be very important. And early treatment can really um, prevent long-term sequela. Now some special tests. We talked a little bit about the position of the hip when looking for synovitis or infection. And sometimes when I'm looking at hip pain, and maybe even the younger athlete, 9, 10, where I think infection and synovitis can be um, much more prevalent, is I like to do a little circumduction exam. And this kind of helps me understand, is the hip joint irritated? Can I, can I get them to relax? Is this a muscle or labral or bony issue? Because if I'm doing this without them contracting anything, and they're having pain, this tells me it's probably an intraarticular problem, inflammation within the hip, and then I might be concerned about thinking about synovitis, infection, or any other additional intraarticular problems. A straight leg raise, very similar to a squat, can help me understand if the pain is coming from their hip flexors, which is also very common. I like to see their straight leg raise. Sometimes this can produce some back pain or sciatica, so it's another good exam for that. But it also, when you do a resisted straight leg raise, and they said, that's what recreates my symptoms, I really think it starts coming from their hip flexors a little bit more from inside the hip joint. Special test. We call this the anterior impingement sign. Now, just because you have it doesn't mean you have hip impingement. However, it is a really good screening exam. When you flex the hip up to about 90 degrees, sometimes a little bit more, you ask, them if you, you ask the patient, does that hurt, does that bother you? I then push the knee towards the midline. I'm gonna repeat this so you guys can. So then I push the knee towards the midline and I internally rotate the foot. 
and ask if that reproduced their symptoms or their pain. And oftentimes they'll say, yes, it feels like a pinching or it irritates. And, and that is uh, what we look for when we're looking for hip impingement or a labral tear. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now again, this exam doesn't mean they have it, but it's a really good screening tool because it's very sensitive. The hip apprehension sign. Now this is very similar to the shoulder and, and what we have seen much more commonly in the youth athlete is more of hip instability, more so than hip impingement. And so I wanna know how does their hip feel to them when I, when I try to do a provocative maneuver to see if it's unstable. I like to get them on their lateral side. I try to, I try to extend, uh, I'm sorry, abduct their hip and externally rotate their hip. And that then will allow me to assess, hey, how does this feel? Does this feel uncomfortable? Does this reproduce your pain? So you can see where I put my hand underneath the knee and I externally rotate, you can see uh, my right hand is trying to push that hip forward. Most hip instability that is clinically symptomatic in these youth athletes, you'll, you'll find that that gives them some apprehension or some feelings that they're uncomfortable. I most commonly see this in my dancers and my gymnasts who are generally ligamentously, light, uh, ligamentously lax at baseline. So, now we're just going to talk, we're going to transition a little bit and just talk about some kind of some overuse conditions. What are some conditions that we're really investigating now that we've kind of dialed in some of the clinical exam features? Apophysitis. Now we talk, this is a familiar x-ray to uh, you guys already. It can really occur at any one of these. So, you know, we're going to go back to the, the root words of, of apophysitis and talk about this a little bit more because, you know, I really call this to a parent. Most parents know what Oshkosh slaughter is. I'm almost, most anyone that either has a youth athlete or, or deals with youth athlete knows what Oshkosh slaughter is. So I oftentimes refer to this as the Oshkosh slaughter of the hip. Now, apo really means away from. We talked already about what an apophysis is. Okay, so um, away from, again, secondary growth plate center where um, a tendon originates or inserts to, it comes off of the bone. Physis is your growth plate. And then you have itis, which is inflammation. So you can see where the root words really help us identify what the problem is. Now, oftentimes the diagnosis is made by the history uh, as well as a physical exam. The pain hurts when I'm active. It's not morning pain, it's not night pain. Um, and it is almost always tender directly over the bony prominence. Now, to me, I really think this is one of the more easier um, exams uh, or diagnoses to have with a history and a physical exam. Oftentimes, you know, x-rays are not needed with the diagnosis, very similar to Oshkosh slaughter. The treatment really is rest. They need a rest, anti-inflammatories. I really believe that in an elite athlete, physical therapy can be very, very useful because what it'll do, it is it'll maintain the athlete's balance and muscle strength and endurance um, while they're going through rehab and resting one area of the body. The physical therapist will help them kind of train up other areas of the body too. So uh, I would strongly advocate for that. Snapping hip. Very common, I'm gonna show you this image as well, which is a very dramatic use of a snapping hip. Snapping hip can happen in two forms. You guys heard me say that earlier. Internal snapping hip is your iliopsoas. It's one of your hip flexors. It rubs up the front part of your hip joint um, and it causes an audible snapping. External snapping hip, you can usually see it. They sometimes describe it as their hip pops in and out of the joint, um, which it clearly doesn't. Um, and oftentimes you can see this as well. This is also a, um, this is also considered an overuse condition. Reassurance is often the best thing that we can do with families, but I do think that adequate stretching, activity modification, talking to them about what their routines are with their particular sport. Most of these conditions we see in long distance runners as well as your dancers and your gymnasts, and so it's very easy for us to kind of counsel them on cross training, attempting different activities. I really think that also your physical therapist can be really useful um, and help uh, and helping kind of the athlete get through uh, this condition as well. So it really sounds like that Caroline had an overuse condition. Um, and we're going to, you know, I, th I think it is a very common uh, thing to, to see overuse conditions in these youth athletes. And we particularly here, one of the most common questions I've gotten in the last nine months is how busy are you with COVID? And the reality is, is boy, we're as busy as we've ever, ever been. We're seeing youth athletes having both acute injuries as well as overuse injuries almost more frequently than we did before COVID. And I wonder if that's because of the dramatic change in activity or not. 
and Caroline's really a classic example of this. She had no real preseason conditioning. She started running for cross country in September, 20 to 30 miles a day. I got some good nutrition. It's, you know, it's okay. Actually, the patient says it's okay, and, and mom and dad may shake their head a little bit. She does have some irregular menses, which may or may not be normal at this age. Um, she hurts for after she runs a mile, but now it really hurts to walk. Here are her x-rays here, and you can see she's got a little bit of a sclerotic area at the base um, of her femoral neck. You can see here's her MRI here, which is um, a condition that I worry quite a bit about, and that's a stress fracture. Um, really, this is important to start talking to them about the hours of training, some training detail, preseason conditioning, the nutrition, and it's a great opportunity to start talking about the female triad. Um, I do see it in both males and females, although we commonly talk about it uh, in females. Most commonly, I see it in my cross-country runners, and, and that, there's just no doubt about that. Um, and those really need to be, um, from a referral basis, I think they really need to be managed by a sports medicine specialist. I think it's really important, to, but, it, but we love to work in collaboration um, with a pediatrician or even an endocrinologist if we really get concerned about repeat uh, stress fractures. We do not routinely get labs on first-time stress fractures, particularly if the clinical uh, kind of the clinical story fits. But if the clinical story doesn't fit, it may be a great opportunity to look for some metabolic conditions as well. I'm going to transition over to acute conditions. Here's Anna. We heard about her um, already. She says, boy, I, I kind of did the splits accidentally. I felt like my hip popped out of socket. No previous injury. And, um, you know, she, she plays club volleyball. Not sure why she was doing the splits. But hip pain in a youth athlete is almost always uh, acute injuries, almost always soft tissue, okay? So about 80% of them are a sprain or a strain around the hip joint, uh, a groin strain, a hip strain, um, hip flexor strain. We see this quite often. It's not always all of these other special conditions. So we have to keep that in mind. Most of the treatment is not unlike a lot of what we already talked about. It's rest. If it's really severe, a short period of, of weight-bearing protection can be really valuable. I usually give it about two weeks and then I like to re-examine them. Um, early therapy with range of motion can be extremely valuable and you gotta get that swelling down. Um, very similar to like an ankle sprain, and I try to say this, I try to, I try to make a lot of um, similarities with familiar conditions, but any soft tissue sprain, I always compare to an ankle sprain. Some people sprain their ankle and they're fine the next day. Some people sprain their ankle and they're still limping at three months. It's all about the severity of the soft tissue injury, and I try to describe that uh, to the patient as well, and that oftentimes will help us kind of gauge our recovery timeline. So here's Anna, we got a, a AP pelvis, and you can see here, AP pelvis gives us a great opportunity to look at one side um, versus another. And when you look um, at that left side, you can see there's just this little bit of this line um, that goes through her um, ischial, um, ischial tuberosity that is a non-displaced avulsion of her ischial tuberosity. Now, it's really important because sometimes we can't tell the difference between normal growth and maturation of the growth plate and a true fracture. And uh, with Anna, she was tender in this location. We actually also got an MRI, uh, which diagnosed that as well. So apophyseal injuries, you know, I, I oftentimes describe it as the weakest link. Is it the muscle, is it the tendon, or is it where the tendon attaches, which is the growth plate? Growth plate is made up of cartilage. It's a lot softer than the tendons um, and the muscle, and that's why in kids, you have apophyseal avulsions. In more physically mature athletes, you'll have soft tissue injuries. You'll have your patella tendon ruptures, your muscle contusions, your muscle strains. You don't oftentimes have those in kids, although you will also, but sometimes that weak link is at the growth plate as well. More commonly, we see this at the tibial tubercle. Again, I'm, I'm just making some analogies on other areas in which you can have a similar problem at a different location. It's much more common. This is an x-ray of a knee in which you have a similar problem where the tibial tubercle, which is where you have Oxford slaughter, actually fracture through the growth plate up into the knee joint and that one requires us to fix it. Apophyseal injuries, about 10% um, happen at the iliac crest. You can see this patient here. We oftentimes can diagnose it on x-ray, um, but we sometimes will get MRIs to determine the severity of it. ASIS, 30% of the time, most commonly AIIS. Both the ASIS and AIIS are your hip flexors, so these can be really important in your runners, and then your uh, ischial tuberosity, much less frequently, and those can actually be uh, the ones that are much more difficult to treat uh, long term as well. You got your uh, greater and lesser trochanter as well as your pubic symphysis in which you can also have similar problems. I really think these need to be managed by some sports medicine specialist. Um, I, I recommend uh, protective weight bearing for about two weeks. Uh, early range of motion can be extremely valuable. 
uh, these x-rays don't look good. You, you need to tell the patients really early on that we're not looking for radiographic healing, we're looking for clinical healing, um, and that can be really important. 12 weeks, usually it's a fracture, so it's not soft tissue. Sometimes you can get those back to sports a little bit earlier. We don't really know uh, what our surgical indications are right now for this. Um, we continue to learn about this. We're part of a multi-center trial, actually looking at some physical measures like strength uh, when we repair these and when we don't repair these, and we, we're still learning about this right now. Some have suggested that if it's greater than two centimeters displaced, that it needs to be fixed surgically. I'm not sure that that's entirely true, but we hope to learn more about that uh, in the future. Now, Tyler. I bet right now you guys all know what Tyler probably has. Loves to play sports. Mom and dad notice a limp. He's about 12 years old. And he walks with a little bit of an externally rotated foot. When he lies down and flex up his hip, he's going to do obligate external rotation. So we all know he has a skiffy. The really important part about the evaluation of a skiffy or any condition that you're worried about in the hip is the AP pelvis can be extremely valuable. When you get an AP pelvis, it gives you an opportunity to look at one side versus another side. So if you have a concern about a left hip and you miss the right hip, sometimes you may miss that the range of motion differences between one hip and another is due to perthes on the other side. And so you really want to be able to look at that uh, the femoral head, which you guys can see both of them here, and how different the epiphysis or that area proximal to the physis really looks from one hip to another one. The AP pelvis is one really useful uh, view. Also, you got to get the frog because you can miss an early skiffy without the frog. You can see this patient had a pretty normal AP pelvis, but you can really tell here that the epiphysis or that that kind of ball, we call it, sometimes we refer to it as an, uh, the ice cream is about to fall off the ice cream cone, um, and you can see how it just looks like it's tilted inward just a little bit. And you can see this kid has bilateral, early, mild slip capital femoral epiphysis because it just is flipping. Um, you can see that ice cream comb is not perfectly straight on that uh, femoral neck. It's very, very subtle, but you can pick it up on that frog lateral. Again, just a, just a, um, a plug for Skiffy. Um, most happen, you know, most common we see it in, in an obese adolescent. Um, you know, oftentimes they complain of knee pain, so just don't be confused. Also, if you have a patient with endocrinopathy, have a lower threshold to investigate this as well. So now we're going to transition to Alfonso. Uh, he's a soccer player, groin pain. Um, you know, he kind of feels like it hurts. Um, he hurts when he sits for a long period of time, but it also hurts when he kicks the ball. So he's got a lot going on. They, they kind of sent the referral to me um, for concern about an MRI for hip impingement or a labral tear. And so we're just going to talk a little bit about hip impingement. Um, it's very common right now. Um, it certainly is popularized in the last 10 to 20 years because of our understanding and our knowledge. We're going to talk a lot about, I'm just going to spend about five or 10 minutes talking exactly about what happens with hip impingement. Um, on the left there, you'll see what a normal hip looks like. We're going to go over some videos so it'll become a little bit more clear. Now, one type of hip impingement is called cam impingement. And that's when the, where the femoral head, the ball, sits on the neck is a little bit enlarged. So when they flex their hip, it kind of pinches. It really is the primary cause of labral tear in youth athletes. Um, this is a video here that talks about pincer impingement. Pincer is another type of femoral acetabular impingement. We say FAI for short, or just hip impingement. Pincer impingement, instead of the ball having too much bone, the socket has too much bone. Okay, so when you look at this video here, you can see that too much acetabular coverage, the socket is a little bit too big, and when you flex the hip up like in a sitting position, or when you kick the ball, or when you do a high kick, if you're a drill team dancer, you can see how this, what this does is it pinches the side of the hip joint. Now your body can probably withstand this because cartilage is soft about 50,000 times, and then it starts to tear, and it starts to get irritated, it starts to get inflamed, then you can start having some chondral damage as well. Second type of impingement is cam impingement. Now what you'll see here is this is a normal looking hip joint. And as we start the video, you're gonna see an enlargement of that femoral head neck junction. And that enlargement then does the same thing, but on the opposite side, we call it a cam type of impingement. And this really pushes up. This is by far more common than pincer. And you can see how it pushes up against the labrum. Again, over time, your body can tolerate it. But once you do it again and again and again, and you have improper 
pelvic mechanics, what this does, it'll cause a labral tear, it'll cause irritation, and you know, sometimes that then subsequently requires surgical management. You can see here, how do we, you know, how do we identify, this is a very young kid here, and we try to look, we try to think of the ball as a circle when we look at this image. Sometimes we draw some angles and we have an idea of what is a normal angle. And you can see when the actual ball has a little bit of overgrowth before it gets to the neck. We call that the alpha angle. Greater than 55 degrees would be indicative of impingement. You can see this is a little bit of a before and after uh, a kid who had hip symptomatic hip impingement. We couldn't get him to get better with non-operative treatment and ended up just shaving the bone arthroscopically. Um, the, there is a lot of literature on this, a lot of randomized controlled trial. The reality is, is that non-operative treatment can work if the, if the athlete is willing to commit to it. Um, a minimum of three months, if that doesn't work, sometimes the intraarticular disease is very great, so they need surgery to repair the labrum, to shave off the bone, and uh, even my mentor, Dr. Phil Pond, has talked about revision surgery uh, when needed. You could see a great image here of a before and after um, arthroscopic treatment for femoral acetabular impingement. Um, several years ago, um, I looked at looking at this age group, 11 to 16, um, and you can see that they all did very, very well. Eight patients needed a revision surgery primarily for scar tissue. Um, I would say if you have somebody that you're concerned that has hip impingement, really conservative management is the key. We want to see if we can get, we can actually heal this without needing surgery. Labral tears, they can become asymptomatic or um, they can heal. We really don't know which one, but we know that there are plenty of literature that suggested that good physical therapy can really treat this condition. If you feel like you want to get an MRI before you refer, that's fine. I would recommend an MR arthrogram um, with contrast in the hip joints or a 3TD MRI because that really helps us look at the labrum. I'm just going to talk about some recent literature um, that, that we produce here at Scottish Rite looking at, uh, looking at this deformity. And so we wanted to look at, you know, what does this mean in adolescence? Because we have a lot of kids that have a lot of hip pain, uh, but their MRIs are normal. But we have kids that have, you know, very mild hip pain, and their MRIs look really bad. Well, it turns out that when we looked at that, we really found that the bigger the bump or the alpha angle, that cam lesion, the more labral disease they had, no matter how much pain they had. And so it was really valuable for us to understand the value and the importance of having this big cam lesion in terms of understanding how much intraarticular damage or damage within the labrum really existed. I'm sure many of you guys are wondering, well, when does this cam lesion, do I have this cam lesion? When does it form? How do I prevent it? The reality is, is we know that this develops during the growth spurt. And what it does is you can see in this image on the right, you can have a, a young hip image and dotted line is the growth plate of the proximal femur of the ball. And you can see in time, with repeated stress, it'll grow down that femoral neck. Well, it turns out that people have looked at this over several sports, soccer, basketball, and they really have determined that those that play athletes, those, I'm sorry, those that play sports or are athletes, compared to those that are non-athletes, they tend to develop this cam lesion. And you can see there's a great image of a soccer player over two years, he grew this cam lesion and it almost exclusively occurs in youth athletes almost always during their growth period. You can see why here, an area of repeated stress, this is, a, this is an MRI image where you can really look at some really soft tissue hypertrophy that occurs on MRI that eventually grows into an, a bony lesion that you can see on x-ray. You know, we started noticing this a little bit in our adolescence as well. Uh, we looked at this female soccer player who had hip pain, and we couldn't figure out why because their x-rays looked really quite normal. Um, and then we found that sometimes you can even have some soft tissue impingement as well. Um, and this is some of our more recent uh, research where we found that almost 10% of our adolescent athletes had soft tissue uh, impinging lesions uh, that you couldn't see on x-rays as well. So uh, we hope to continue to learn more about this impinging lesion. But what's really important is this is another reason why we need to continue to control the amount of training that our youth athletes are undergoing, particularly during the growth spurt. It's gotten really crazy and it's gotten nuts. And this cam lesion, the development of this cam lesion, most certainly will create early osteoarthritis of the hip. It has been, it has been studied with level one evidence that this cam lesion is bad. And we really have to dial in how much our youth athletes are playing, again, during the growth spurt or during periods of rapid growth, um, really during puberty, 
is really where we need to control this as much as we can. So I just want to mention a few important considerations. Um, and the, this is what I call lines in the grass. These are things you don't want to miss, OK? Um, in kids, sometimes a little bit different from adults, um, we will see some types of tumors um, in the hip, uh, or really you know, benign tumors. So we'll see synovitis, whether inflammatory or not. We can see infections. Um, we also see PVNS, um, which, uh, you know, pigmented villonodular synovitis, uh, we see this in hip, and we see osteoid osteomas in the hip as well. So all of these have diagnostic criteria that you can see on clinical exam that can help you to the diagnosis. Please, please, please don't forget about an intra-abdominal exam as well. Ovarian cysts can be painful, particularly they burst. Adolescents will describe them as hip pain. You can have back pain, you can have appendicitis. I've seen hernias, radicular pain from sciatica, um, even constipation where they've claimed the hip, that they have hip pain down here in this area that ended up uh, being constipation. Sacroiliitis, we don't want to forget this here. It can also be inflammatory as well as um, infectious. So don't think, please always consider to think outside the box when you're thinking about an adolescent with hip pain. I know we went over a lot of stuff, um, so I just want to just highlight a little bit that um, these handouts, we've created these to be an easy reference to the diagnosis of common conditions in the youth athlete. So these are available um, uh, for you, so please don't hesitate. As you can tell, it helps you kind of dial in your his history, what are common clinical findings, as well as your AP, uh, as well as what radiographs we'd recommend. And you can see here, it's very common, AP frog pelvis. Really easy for most conditions. So if you want one buzzword for hip pain, it's gonna be your AP and frog pelvis. Um, in summary, um, I know that was a lot of information. I'm really hoping that uh, if you guys saw it online, great, maybe you can reverse or you can go to a slide you really like or rewatch something. Um, this will be online and available on demand uh, for up to three months. So please don't hesitate to use that as well as all of our on-demand content uh, that Jared mentioned um, earlier. Uh, a good clinical exam is really important. Um, it really oftentimes can lead you to the diagnosis. An AP frog x-ray uh, is really your appropriate x-ray when evaluating hip pain. 80% uh, of injuries are really soft tissue injuries, um, but don't, don't uh, uh, don't forget to, to think about specific injuries to adolescents. Um, and if you think you want to get an MRI, an MRI arthrogram is really the way to go unless you have access to a 3T MRI and they can avoid uh, the injection altogether. Thank you. Any questions? Hip impingement is usually in the older adolescent or the young adult. So we most commonly see between 16 and 25 Although, because of the increase in sports that we're seeing in our youth athletes, we're seeing it much more commonly in that 14 to 18 year old range, which is really uh, my population. Hip impingement can occur even up into your 30s and 40s as well, but really it's the repetitive overload um, of that 18 to 25 year old athlete that, we're, that we see it most commonly. I've seen it as young as 12, 11 years old. Again, it is initially, particularly in youth and adolescents, it's initially a non-operative condition, um, so I would strongly encourage you to think that first before you think about label tears and surgery as well, although that's what you'll commonly um, Google if you um, Google hip impingement as surgical treatment. Yeah, I think it's really important to have a really close relationship with your physical therapist, um, either locally or within the community. Um, we've tried to really, we have um, a great physical therapy team here and that really the advantage of it is we have a flowing dialogue. Uh, but I would also say that um, because we're more of a referral center, physical therapy is very geographic. You typically go two or three times a week, so you want to do a place close to home. Um, I like to really establish an ongoing relationship with the physical therapist and know their comfort level with the age group. So if it's a young athlete that is um, if it's a young athlete, I want to get to know that therapist and know that they feel comfortable treating a young athlete for a hip condition. Um, the other thing that I would say is hip pain um, is really common in our, in our gymnasts and our dancers, and I really feel like therapists within the community really have experience with dancers and gymnasts. They almost talk a different language. They have a different way about them. Their training, their therapy may be a little bit different, so I even will try to match a therapist with a sport. You have a lot of therapists who are ex-dancers, that are ex-basketball players, and you really want to try to match their sport with their, um, you try to match the 
athlete sport with a therapist, I find they can find a connection and we'll have a more effective therapy as well. Yeah, I would say everyone's mechanics are different. And some people have uncoordinated runs and they're goofy runs. That's okay. Um, it doesn't necessarily cause a concern. Um, I, sometimes I think a change in the way that your young athlete is is, way, is by far more important than actually just noticing, hey, my kid's kind of uncoordinated. Sometimes I get a referral just because they want, I need someone to analyze my kid's running because he's, he's a little goofy. Not really a cause of concern. Sometimes that's just mechanics. We're all built a little bit differently. Um, however, a change in the mechanics is important. A kid that didn't limp, that now limps, is really important. Someone who had a very normal run, now you see, well, wait a second, they now have an abnormal run. Now that could be because of their growth spurt and because of their developmental changes, but I do think a dramatic change in the way they do things is probably a little bit more important than maybe just um, what we commonly see is, you know, some kids are more athletic or more coordinated than others, so. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good question. There are, um, you know, a couple things just to highlight on the clinical exam. Uh, you know, my hip exam is, I feel like, one of my more detailed exams. I, I really want to try to identify what's going on. It's so much harder than other areas of the body. Um, and so the history really can help narrow in and focus your clinical exam, depending on what you hear and what you're investigating. I do think that there is a lot of uh, special tests that you have to combine and use. Like you had suggested, the squat is really valuable, uh, both two-legged squat, single-leg squat. I want to know what causes the pain, how they squat. I would say from my standpoint as someone who sees a lot of hip pain, my hip exam is, is more of a 15-20 minute exam, depending on what the condition is and what I'm investigating. Um, but for the purposes of a, a screening exam for most you know, general providers, you know, a, a, we, you know, we tried to kind of narrow it in on, on some of the more common and, and um, more specific areas as more of a screening exam. But I, I do think there's a lot of valuable other um, diagnostic tests that you got to do in clinic as well. Great question. Yeah, so the question was, um, are there more sports that are more likely to cause hip pain? Uh, yeah, no, there really is no doubt about that. Um, you know, classically, hip impingement is frequently called, uh, caused from basketball, hockey, soccer, football, particularly our kickers. Um, we see that the most common uh, sports for hip impingement. Probably the majority of the patients that I see for hip pain are your dancers, your dimnists, your cheerleaders, and it's because they repetitively load their hip joint at extremes of motion over and over and over again. And so they don't necessarily have hip impingement, but they have hip pain because of what they do with their hip joint. Many times is because their hip joint is so loose that they have a little bit of micro instability in their hip joint. Sometimes they need a little bit of rest to get the inflammation down, and then proper mechanics need to be retrained into the hip joint. Um, to address some of these issues of, of instability. But most of the hip pain I see in, in um, young tumblers and gymnasts, um, fortunately those are mostly treated with activity modification and physical therapy over, um, over really you know, true hip pain. Yeah, I, th I think that's a really good question. And you really have to individualize this to the athlete. You have to really, the first thing you do when you identify an overuse athlete is try to have an understanding of what their goals are. You know, swimming, tennis, golf, year-round sports, um, and so they don't have a, a season. And so oftentimes you have to try to work through um, periods of rest. Sometimes you talk to athletes about how do we get you through this season or get you through this period to try to get you a scholarship until we create a rest and rehabilitation. And so, um, you know, overdoing it, whether sports specialization, one sport, year round sports, it really is so, so variable. So once you identify a condition and you're trying to figure out how to treat them, the first question I ask is, well, what are your goals? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and then tell me what your next six to 12 months look like. And so we can try to individualize a plan to treat the condition um, and give them some opportunities to cross-train, activity modification, do something different. You know, 
That's a really, uh, a really good question. The only thing that I, that I will comment on uh, on that is sports specialization is a buzz term. You know, we have historically said that you really shouldn't specialize in any one sport um, until the age of 14. I would tell you there's two things I've learned in the last several years. Uh, number one is is um, NBA and NFL are recruiting multi-sport athletes because they last longer and they have less injuries. So multi-sport athlete through your entire career is more important. The second thing, and we really learned this from our COVID study um, in which we surveyed about 700 youth athletes during COVID. And what we found is those that were uh, played a single sport were more likely to have some early symptoms of anxiety and depression according to the PROMISE score. And so they had higher anxiety and depression scores compared to the multi-sport athlete in our COVID survey. So I, I think somehow there may be a mental resiliency that can occur in a multi-sport athlete. So it's a great question. So I think um, cross-training a multi-sport athlete is just really valuable to our youth athletes right now. 